Welcome back to the Fandom Zone Podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Charles Skaggs, back in the Fandom Zone, ready to talk more Jupiter's Legacy with my wonderful friend, wonderful co-host, and someone who is very happy that his Montreal Canadiens are in the playoffs, DJ Nick. How you doing, Nick? Hey, Charles. I'm doing very well, thank you. And yes, indeed, we kind of squeaked through there, and I guess we'll see how long it lasts. I'm obviously enjoying the ride while it lasts, but uh, I guess we'll see how deep we get in. And other than that, uh, doing very, very well. And how about yourself? Well, obviously, I'm going to have to start rooting for the Canadians, like we were talking about before we started recording, because, well, my Columbus Blue Jackets suck, and they continue (laughs) to suck. So at least yours are in. And if I, you know, maybe if I root for the Canadians, then, you know, that at least gives me somebody to root for, right? So it gives, exactly. gives me at least a reason to watch the playoff now. Yes. One of the few people who doesn't root for the Toronto Maple Leafs. I mean, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody's got to be a contrarian, and then who better than me, right? That's right, exactly. Right. I've got decades of experience with that. <laughs> All right, so here in episode 218... Nick and I are going to be discussing what's the use, and please don't say that's about our podcast, right? Like, what's the use of of this podcast? That's an episode title. Just leave it there. And Cover Her Face, which are the fifth and sixth episodes of Jupiter's Legacy that came out back on May 7th, 2021. Yep. And I'm very interested to talk about these with you because there's a lot going on now. We're kind of starting to see where the series is going, or at least where they want the series to go. But interestingly, at this halfway mark, there was a change in showrunner as a little behind the scenes stuff went on where Stephen DeKnight, Mm -hmm. I guess, had some quote unquote creative differences. Right. That old standby (laughs) and dropped out of the series. So he was replaced by Sung Kyu Kim who was the writer of Cover Her Face. And so it's, I'm kind of curious to see where the show goes from here. Yeah. You know, we're going to discuss, obviously, episodes five and six, and then you know, we have the final two episodes next week to discuss. Yeah. But um, I'm very curious to see how that goes. What do you think? Well, it's true because I, to be honest, I don't see the storyline concluding with just this one season. I mean, I can see... Maybe the 1929 stuff to a certain extent, but also right. after that, there's so much more to explain. Yeah. And honestly, I don't see them doing it in two episodes. Seeing also the length of some of these episodes, I don't see them doing it. Not to mention, as I said, you are following two storylines. Right. Very closely. And you're constantly going between one and the other. I wonder whether, I mean, Grant asked, I don't know if there's news where Netflix had ordered another season or not. Or if for now this is all we get, we we have. Yeah, not yet. So it's it's a little concerning because, well, you know, you're you're setting up these storylines, but if you're not having that big payoff and you're not sure you're getting a second season, yeah. But maybe they're just hoping. I guess we have to wait and hope, and that the ratings right. are good. But this could be another situation of another one and done from Netflix, which concerns me because it's not like that hasn't happened before from Netflix. They do have a track record in Mm -hmm. that sense. So I guess we'll have to see because I just hope they don't rush it with the fear of we might not get another season. Let's wrap it up as sort of speedily as we can and sacrifice good storytelling for that reason. Hopefully that won't be the case because so far I'm really, really enjoying this. But I I was just thinking to myself from the the, uh, storytelling standpoint, how do you do it in two other episodes? I just don't see it happening. I, I, I think we'll probably end maybe on a cliffhanger. And uh, and just have to cross our fingers and hope we'll get a second season, or yeah. they might wrap because you're going to have to give precedence to one of the two storylines if you want to close it up properly. Because with the 1929 stuff and uh, the mm-hmm. current day, one of the two is going to have to give. I think if you want to have something satisfying by the end, I could be wrong, but that's the way I'm kind of seeing it at this point. Well, what I, from what I noticed, you know, this Net, Jupiter's Legacy was in Netflix's trending section. You know, oh, like yeah. it was, it was, you know, that it was one of their top ten most viewed. Yeah, when you know that first week. Mm-hmm. So I'm guessing everybody just binged the thing at once because it was only eight episodes, right. which is the kind yeah. of thing that Netflix, I think, likes. Well, that's their business model, I think. Right, I guess. right. So hopefully that w- whatever that for that week, it was enough. To convince them, okay, maybe we'll go ahead and do another season of this. 
We can only hope. I mean, it went to number one over here in Italy as well. It's currently sitting at number six, so it's still in the top ten, which is not bad. Okay, but it's um, yeah, it is good. That means at least it's getting it has some legs. Yeah. So who's hoping? I mean, I'm glad it's doing well overseas. So far, it seems so. That's an encouraging sign because if it's doing good in other markets, Mm -hmm. they might be willing to pony up the the budget to create a second season. I mean, I actually talked to a friend of mine over here the other day who'd actually seen the whole thing. He was one of the bingers. Mm -hmm. And he said he really, really enjoyed it. And this is a man who's never picked up a comic in his life. Really? I mean, he is, yeah, he's a superhero movie and TV show fan, but he's never read a comic. I mean, big fan of the MCU, big fan of the DCEU and all this kind of stuff. He said, I absolutely loved it. It was great. But yeah, as I said, he is a non-comic book uh, reader, but he really enjoyed it. So I guess he was kind of like my soundboard, if you will, <laughs> when it came to, to the show. I said, but oh, he's I somebody seen... who appreciates superhero TV shows. That's right. So that's why I think he'd be one of the, um, you know, one of the members of the audience that possibly Netflix is looking at, one of their target audience members. Well, let's so... hope so. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, we, here in the States, we Netflix isn't tracked ratings-wise like the networks are. Right, sure. So it's kind of hard to gauge about how well a show did. Mm, exactly. Like we, all we can rely on is their own data that they're so reluctant to provide anyway. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I'm sure exactly in some high office they have the number of times yeah. the show was downloaded or viewed, kind of like with us with our podcasts. So I guess it's the same kind of thing. But uh, hopefully uh, hopefully they, they will renew it because uh, I'd hate for it to be a truncated story. and just you know, be, I'd like uh, to at least get one more season if we're gonna, to wrap up the storylines. Yeah, I mean, depending, obviously, I mean, I haven't seen episodes seven and eight yet, so yeah. um, I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, it, I, it's still, regardless, I'd still want more because it's a really, really well done show so far. Yeah, I think so. I think so. All right. Mm-hmm. So episode five was written by Kate Barno, who is notable because she wrote several episodes of the HBO series True Blood, Ooh. which Lori and I were fans of back in the day. And... The second episode, you know, the fifth episode, Cover Her Face, was written, like I said, by Sung Q Kim, the new mm-hmm. showrunner. Both episodes, and this seems to be the case, that they're doing these in two-episode blocks throughout oh. the season. So episodes five and six were both directed by Charlotte Brenstrom, mm-hmm. who is interesting because, for one thing, she's going to be directing at least one of the episodes of the new Lord of the Rings series for Amazon. Which we're still waiting on. <laughs> which we're still waiting. We're supposed to be getting it sometime in 2021, which probably will be like, if we get in 2021, it'll be like December 31st, 2021. Yeah, exactly. By, by all accounts. But she's also directed episodes of The Witcher, mm-hmm. Arrow, which is interesting, Ooh. and Outlander. Okay. So it's a very interesting directing resume for television. But yeah, she directed five and six, and... You know, especially notably six, because that is such a like a, a big sea adventure movie a little bit. Yeah. You know, where, where most of everything that's set in 1929 takes place aboard this boat as we're sailing mm-hmm. toward what everybody hopes is Sheldon's Island. Exactly. So yes. his, his dream his dream island. And I thought it made for a very gripping drama. I can't wait to talk about that episode. Is, oh, yes. Because I think that's my favorite episode of these two this week. All right. New cast this time. We have the introduction of Paul Amos as Barnabas Wolf, who is a very (laughs) interesting character. What a character. Yeah, very flamboyant character, but interesting nonetheless. He's been in episodes of Designated Survivor, Warehouse Mm -hmm. 13, and Lost Girl, the last two aired on Sci-Fi Channel here in in the States. Okay. In the sixth episode, we have David Julian Hirsch, who was introduced as Dr. Richard Conrad, who is someone who we will find out becomes one of the union. Mm-hmm. I won't say which one yet, <laughs> but I know. He was uh, in the movie Confessions of a Dangerous Mind Ooh. and has appeared in episodes of Grimm, Weeds, and the TV version of La Femme Nikita. Oh, nice. Yeah, Confessions of Dangerous Minds is actually a good movie. First movie that George Clooney ever directed. Yeah, it was. And it was uh, based on Chuck Barris, you know, the gong show host. Yeah. And then he went on to do Good Night and Good Luck. So, I mean, it goes to show you what George Clooney likes, what kind of movies George Clooney likes to direct. Pretty much, pretty much, yeah. It's almost becoming like he's a better director than an actor these days. Yes. Yeah. Then we had Kara Royster as Jenna Croft, a.k.a. Ghost Beam, once again. Mm-hmm. 
And Chase Tang played Baryon. Nice. Now, I, d- I just have one bit of trivia. Okay. So, in the comics, Barnabas Wolf first appears in this comic I'm holding in my hot little hands. Ooh, nice. Jupiter's Legacy number five. I don't know if you can see that image there. Yes, indeed. That's, that's what Frank Quitely draws him as. Apologies, those in podcast land, but I was treated to a very nice comic book cover. Exactly. Obviously, I understand. Yeah, you, you out there, you, you wonderful listeners out there, you can't see what I'm holding, but Nick can. So he gets the perks. You know, he's the co-host, <laughs> I guess. So, but he was introduced in the comics as a major in the U.S. government's anti-terror unit whose responsibility was to find any unlicensed superhumans. Okay. And um, I could tell you more, but that would be spoiling some future events, potentially. Right, okay. No, no, that's that's fine. So if we do get more episodes of Jupiter's Legacy, I don't want to spoil those for you if you haven't read the comics. So Exactly. No, no, uh, don't, don't be like River Song. Spoilers. Spoilers. Boy, you mean... Spoilers. There you go. We love you, Alex Kingston. We very, very, we love you very much. Exactly, exactly. So, two episodes. So let's start with our first episode. What's the use? And again, that's not our about our podcast. Okay. <laughs> Please keep that straight. All right. So, topic number one. Let's talk Sheldon, Jack the therapist, mm. and Grace, as we. We're in 2021 setting, and this episode opens with Sheldon sitting down with a, th- a therapist. So I think a lot of us have been wondering to this point, well, Sheldon's got some issues, and he doesn't seem to be talking to anybody about said issues. But here we, we find out that, yeah, apparently he is talking to someone who's played by Nigel Bennett and uh, talking about his current situation. He talks about that. Things are stressful at home with Grace. Chloe won't listen to him. Brandon killed a guy <laughs> and doesn't think he did anything wrong. Well, and by the way, the country, 78% of the country agrees with Brandon. And I don't get how these 78% of the American people have an issue with the code that I've been spending my whole life trying to abide by. It, it reinforces that concept we were talking about. It's everybody's wrong, and I'm the one who's right. Mm-hmm. They don't get the the game. I do. Right, right. It's their their fault, not me. So, so at least he's talking to somebody, right? Yes. You know, at least he's opening up to somebody. But you know, the the therapist is, you know, recognizing that you know that his conflict is, you know, with the people who matter the most in his life, but. You know, he wants to know why Sheldon's so hung up on this statistic, you know, the 78 percent. And so we we kind of get into a little bit of a deep dive into Sheldon's psyche a little bit. So what did you make of that? Well, as you mentioned, I was so glad he actually talked to somebody. You'd think it would be better he maybe talked it over with Grace and not somebody who he then who's then revealed to be Mm -hmm. pretty much his worst one of his worst enemies which I think was a fabulous reveal. You I love, love that. You love that. that reveal, huh? Yes, I did. Also because it even gave it more of that Clarice, Dr. Lecter vibe. As in, she's almost, he's almost confessing his sins to his worst enemy. And it's, it also kind of reminded me, I mean, I don't want to you know, kind of go too much crazy here, but with the comedian in Watchmen, when he sits on the bed of his own worst enemy is about to die. And Moloch. he's telling him. Moloch, with, yeah. Exactly, with Moloch. I kind of was like, Kind of that moment where, yeah, the comedian's like, I'm confessing my my sins to my worst enemy. This is kind of the, what was going on with Sheldon, because we learn that uh, the therapist was, you know, a major villain at the time. And that's why you almost get that almost psychopath kind of vibe, because also the way he talks to Sheldon is clearly, OK, he's a licensed therapist. But you could tell there was something more to that, because his bedside manner every now and then tends to go a bit odd. And since he calls him out on his BS, he's not understanding. He's not like, don't worry, things will get better. And those kinds of like, oh, yeah, no, he, that's rubbish. Yeah, yeah <laughs> he's, he's, he's almost a little bit antagonistic. Yes. And so, so the vibe I got from this, mm-hmm. this relationship, and especially, you know, the, as we get the reveal, it's almost like if Superman, because remember, mm-hmm. Sheldon is a Superman analog. Oh, yes, of course. It's almost if Superman 
went to the prison where Lex Luthor was being kept, his oh, arch enemy, with him. and yeah. talked with and opened up with him because he couldn't do that with Lois Lane. It would. It, I love that to comparison. I mean, maybe it's almost like who can maybe understand you more than the person you've been fighting for a large part. But that's of your the life. dynamic I got here. Yeah, and you is know, it, so it's like you know, the only person that best knows me is my arch enemy. It's almost like if you know, like in, in like say if you had Batman, feeling that he could only talk with the Joker. And, and that would make for such a great story, I think. I mean, they've done, they've hinted it in some places I where mean, Batman it, and Joker have actually A little hint down. about that in, in Batman the Killing Joke, a little joke, bit. Joke, yeah. Right? Yeah, but, but, you know, just, I think because with Batman's nature, he's not going to reveal too much about himself to the Joker. No, because he plays his cards too much, too close to the vest. In but that Superman sense. is yeah. generally more open. So he's I more guess, trusting than Batman, definitely. Yeah, so, okay, so... Superman opening up to Luther makes more sense, especially if, especially if you consider like if you go way back to like Je our friend Jesse Jackson does to the Silver Age comics where of course that Lex Luthor and Superman used to be friends when when you know, when they were both teens in Smallville before sure. Superboy accidentally caused Lex's hair to fall out and they and they became <laughs> enemies for life <laughs> because Superboy made Lex bald. Exactly, and you hold that against Superman for the rest of your for life. For the rest of, of his course. life, yeah. I'm, I'm going to kill people. I'm going to threaten the world because because I lost may, my hair. Because you made my hair fall out. It's all your fault. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Talk about motivation. I mean, okay. yeah, right. <laughs> that's, that's the way Silver Age comics were back in the 50s and 60s. So, yeah. no, true. They didn't need much of a motivation to turn somebody into a villain. But no, you make uh, no. A, a fabulous comparison there for sure. And, and I, but I really, really love this uh, this exchange. Not to mention, I'm a big fan of psychological thrillers. So that's where I kind of obviously I got me. I was geeking out a little bit on that mm -hmm. because of the back and forth and the discussing and how animated it started to become after a while. Like you yeah. said, he, the, the therapist was coming rather antagonistic and I was really enjoying it. And the writing is very, very good in this too. Mm -hmm. Both actors do a fabulous job. And it almost seems like uh, it makes you wonder the fact that at the end of the day, is Sheldon such a lonely man? It, does he really feel, feel that he's alone? Because maybe highlights his loneliness that he can't even open to the woman that he loves more than anything else in the world or his brother. He literally feels misunderstood, I yeah. think. And this, I think, stems back to when nobody believed him when he was going crazy in inverted commas. And that could maybe be a, a trauma from that of they didn't believe me then. I don't feel I can open up to these people and I have to go to another source like my own worst enemy. Yeah. Almost kind of makes me wonder if Sheldon is a fan of the R.E.M. song Superman. <laughs> I am, I am Superman. I, I wonder I can do anything. <laughs> Great song, by the way. Yeah. I do wonder, had George been around Sky Fox and they'd yeah. still been friends, he probably would have talked to Sky Fox. Probably. Cause probably, yeah. That's the vibe we also get through these episodes, how tight George and Sheldon were. Mm -hmm. And he was like the only one who believed him. So I think Sky Fox or George would have been the first choice had they still been in contact. So, uh, but yeah, he's a very troubled man. You can definitely tell them that, uh, that uh, Sheldon very much carries the weight of the world on his shoulders. And, yep. you know, it's, and it's important to talk to somebody. I think both, you know, watching this show and in real life, folks, if you have a problem, don't keep it all inside. Talk to someone. Well, that's one of the, you know, one of the things I find, you know, so frustrating about some people that, you know, go back. I keep going back to Superman on this, but for people that have a problem with Superman, that they think he's just such a bland character in their eyes. Yeah, well, that's overpowered. He's what overpowered, you exactly. You know, he's, he's just, he's not interesting. He's not real enough. And I'm thinking, okay, if you had the power to do all this stuff, wouldn't you feel this great responsibility to go along with that? And how that might weigh on you after a time, exactly. and so, and you're you're doing everything you can to try to you know, to to be that beacon of hope for everybody. So I think that's what makes him a an interesting character to me, at least. 
Agreed. Folks, watch Superman and Lois and Lois and you'll get the, the get that very much that's, that's very much highlighted in Superman and Lois. I second that recommendation. But 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 getting back to Jupiter's legacy, mm-hmm. um Sheldon, you know, in this, he talks about, and I thought this was a key, key moment. He mm-hmm. talks about this reoccurring dream of his about his father's death. Yeah. And he, he mentions that he tries to stop his father from jumping off that building yeah. every time, but is never fast enough. Mm-hmm. So translation, if only I was faster, I could have saved my dad. That's his key issue right there. And so the therapist, Jack, mentions that, well, parents aren't supposed to leave their kids by choice. And when they do, it leads the children to believe that it was their fault. And he thinks this is why Sheldon is so attached to the code. Right. So, so this, is, this is the therapist's explanation about why Sheldon is so damn fixated on that code. Because he's – the underlying reason is he blames himself for not being fast enough to save his father. And we actually had talked about this in previous episodes about the fact that uh, it was very likely that the death of his father would haunt him yeah. because the fact of, of – he wasn't a superhero yet. He didn't have powers yet, but it was the one man he couldn't save. And yeah. it was one of the men who mattered the most to him because it was his dad for crying out loud. But uh, – but so so this, confer- this confirmation made sense to you? Or this, this oh, very theory? Much so, very much so. Yeah. Very much so, because obviously you think that since he's become the utopian, he has saved countless lives, but I'm sure it probably haunts him at night thinking, I wasn't able to save my father. Yeah. And um, so we have, uh, let's see. One of the things that Sheldon... Um, says, you know, this is, I guess, um, Sheldon sees this code about, is a good way to reduce the amount of death yeah. that, um, that, he, that Sheldon needs to deal with. And he says, that's all fine and good, but your enemies are almost guaranteed to want to try and kill you. Yes. So. And he would know. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, so. Um, he tries to give the impression that uh, and this is the way they, we start getting a little bit of connection between them. And, uh, you know, he just, he points out that it, like if there was any other field similar to yours, they have the right to kill as a last line of defense. Right, yes. But apparently that's he, not... He, he mentioned the military and law enforcement. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But, but... You know, if it was if, but the other members of the union, you know, they have to remember this code, which is so it's it, which is essentially if the other members of the union follow the code, then that means they're following what you do, and that's a way they remember you because mm-hmm. you're associating yourself so strongly with that code. Yeah, well, because it's literally – it defines him. It's yeah. kind of like Judge Dredd with the law. He – there's no – there's literally bl- no – it's only black and white. It's very much – that's why I very much was reminding me of Judge Dredd in that sense because there's no gray in between. Yeah. You've done wrong. You pay the you, – you know, I won't even, you know, try and think about all the little intricacies of, of every single person's crime. I just automatically execute them because that's what the law says. Yeah. And so – Consequently, you know, this is, he sees himself, and this is something you kind of picked up on, that Sheldon sees himself as a bit of an, or, well, Sheldon doesn't see himself as this, but the therapist kind of implies this, that he's a narcissist. Mm. And Sheldon's like, no, 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 look, like, I just want to be remembered by the people that I love after I leave this world. Yeah, because I did not think he was a narcissist either. I don't think he's in love with himself mm-hmm. or that he thinks he's all that. I literally just think that the problem is he he is so – he lets the, the code define him. And we see that obviously in these episodes that gets put to the test very much. But also, you know, one could make the argument of if you don't follow the code and you just kill, yeah. do you become a vigilante? And hence there's law enforcement and such – allow you to carry on doing what you're doing because there is also that as well mm-hmm. there's also the fact of 
you can't take the law into your own hands. It's saying by due process, you have to, you have to kill, you have to take this person. They have to, you know, be, 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 uh, go, go on the trial and everything else. So I think it's also that is where do you draw the line between being a hero and being a vigilante? Right. And that's, you know, that's the whole thing that, that Brandon's act has, you know, this, this discussion and it's triggering, mm. you know, like there's these lingering effects throughout this entire series. You know, it's this big moral debate and uh, it's, 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 you know, it's something that, you know, is obviously not going to be explained or dealt with very soon, right. but, but it's kind of key to understanding what's, you know, really going on with Sheldon. Yes. And why this, why he's so bothered by this and why he's so bothered with Brandon that Brandon is so willing to go against what Sheldon believes. Which tends to sometimes though be the case, isn't it? Yeah. When it comes to fathers and sons right. or daughters saying, you have to do this. Most of the time they will do the opposite. Yeah. Like I want you to be like me, but the son is like, no, no, I want to be me. I don't want to be you. That's You're exactly you, isn't... you be you. I'm going to be me. That kind of thing. That's right. I mean, and Chloe makes quite that statement. In fact, to her mother, which we will talk, get to later, but yeah. Yeah. So later we talk, you know, after we get some flashbacks with um, Sheldon breaking up with Jane or Jane dumping Sheldon, um, we get back, you know, to the, to the therapies um, sessions with Jack. And they talk about that Jane, Sheldon saw Jane's leaving him as punishment for not being good enough. And he tells, you know, Sheldon tells Jack, well, I know my code is the symbol for being good and that it's impossible to prevent tragedy. But, you know, the world, Sheldon, I, like, Sheldon believes that the world hasn't always been cruel. And when people did good things, they were rewarded. And then Jack reminds him, and this is where I think it was very interesting. The world has never been this way. Exactly. I mean, that's why it's literally a utopia. It's an ideal. Right, right. And, you know, we've discussed that, that the name, the utopian, sums up Sheldon so perfectly because he's a utopian at heart. He has this idyllic fantasy of how things should be, mm -hmm. but that pesky reality getting in the way. And that's kind of what Jack reminds him of is like, you know, the world's never been this way. And it's only your belief in the code that made it seem that way. Yeah. So you created, was, uh, you keep creating this fantasy world for yourself, this, this ideal utopia for yourself. So you're setting yourself up to fail because you can never reach it. Exactly, which was which was one of the main points which was actually made to the to um, Sheldon by Chloe. The right. fact is like we will never be able to reach that standard, and neither will you, because it is an unreachable uh, way goal. to be. It's an unreachable yeah. goal, ideal. Yeah. Yeah. So, and as a result, you know, Jack feels that Sheldon has constructed this barrier from the horrible things that are out there. Like the world is a horrible place. And here you are in your little fantasy land. And this is kind of something that I think Walter brought up. Mm -hmm. You know, that when he, when Walter was criticizing George, it's like, hey, you're just feeding his little delusions. That's right. So it kind of, it kind of just keeps coming back to Sheldon, you know, being off on planet Sheldon. <laughs> true yeah it's it's a, it's a status it's a maybe it is a question of him just sticking his head in the sand and refusing to see what the what the yeah. world really is because then also i believe the point is made to him then why do bad things happen to good people and vice versa yeah but then jack makes a final point before they we get the big reveal that oh hey he's locked up in prison and apparently he's this psycho killer and uh... yeah exactly or you know like like I said, maybe like the Lex Luthor to Sheldon Superman, mm -hmm. that reality, whether you like it or not, is seeping in. Mm -hmm. And that's your problem right now is that reality is breaking down your little fantasy world. And, and it's literally traumatizing him. And I have to say, for being a prisoner, I guess he's probably on good behavior because he has quite the library and right? quite the amenities for being in a prison cell. <laughs> well, maybe it's kind of like, you know, maybe they were friends at one point and maybe Sheldon just kind of hooks him up. 
me putting a good word saying, you know, give him his books. And, yeah. well, I suppose like even in, in Hannibal, when he behaves himself, they give him like a toilet and the books yeah. and, and the drawings, else. you know, the sketch pads that he can draw on yeah. with charcoal and whatnot. But yeah, you know, so he can sketch his pictures of uh, Florence. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then he literally move a library into his cell. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Memories are all I have, Agent Styling. So, <laughs> all right, that could take us down to a whole other road. But uh, anything else about Sheldon or you know Jack the Therapist? I absolutely just thought it was such a great, great scene. Some folks, I think, might have thought it tr- it went on a little bit, but I feel the two actors really kept it going, and it was a nice little uh, pause, if you will, to kind of really, I guess, uh, pick Sheldon's brain and yeah. see at what point he's at now, and hopefully this conversation will seep in and he will, you know, wake up and smell the coffee. Yeah. Hopefully here's hopefully. Now I know that uh, we we didn't really talk about um, Grace much, but Grace was out there talking with Sheldon about Brandon and she's concerned, thankfully, you know, because Sheldon's grounded Brandon after killing Black Star, or at least the Black Star clone as it finds out. And, and, and grounding is taking him to his first autopsy. Okay. Yeah, Yeah. Whatever. Right. But Sheldon thinks he, you know, he still needs to learn more accountability and responsibility. And Grace tries to get through to him, probably fails, but tries. Like, look, we're raising a superhero, but we're also raising a human being. So what did you make at least of Grace's attempt here? Well, first off, I don't know if it's just me, but it seems like uh, their marriage is kind of strained at this point. Mm -hmm. Well, there are some strains. Granted, it seems like they have the makeup sex in the next episode. So I'm guessing that that that's that's one of the great things about, I guess, uh, having an argument is the making up, as they say. But uh, (laughs) that's what I'm thinking is probably what happened. But there it seems there's quite a few strains. They are still at odds today. And, uh, and it, she, even she can't get to him. It, it shows, I think, how pig-headed Sheldon is. It is, yeah. Yeah, it does. And, and I'm glad, and I hopefully, uh, once again, it seems like if he loves her so much, he should kind of listen to her. And r- she also calls him out on the fact of, you just sent him off to I view this autopsy as a punishment, and you didn't even consult me. Yeah. It's kind of, this is our kid. It's like, oh, you weren't around, so I kind of, and she's like, BS, yeah, yeah, I was right. here, <laughs> whatever. So you kind of have to talk to your wife, Sheldon, you know? You kind of, um, you, you almost have to wonder, like, how did they stay married for 90 years? It really is, you know, it, it, it's odd, because it really made me think, you know, you and I talk about this briefly, about the movie Giant. Yeah. Where you have these two folks that are married forever, and they're constantly at odds. It's very much like the couple that you get in Giant, where you have Rock Hudson and Elizabeth Taylor constantly butting heads, but they stay married forever. It's like, yeah, I agree with you. It's like, how the heck did these two even, I don't know. Kind of sounds like my Marriage par- is weird. Kind of sounds like <laughs> my parents, actually, but they've been married over 60 years, but. But anyway, but, uh, anyway uh, before I have to end up with my own therapy session, probably should move on. <laughs> So, topic number two. Let's talk about Chloe and Hutch, because we, you know we've been we were introduced to Hutch now, and we were, we talked about this at the end of last week's episode. How you, you were just blown away by that cliffhanger of Chloe overdosing. Yes. So you got it. You had to know what happened next, and of course, what happens next is she's in the hospital, but. Hutch is there with her. Did that surprise you? I was shocked because I'm sure you probably knew Charles because you you were, you've read the comics. So you're like, so you, I have to say you have a great poker face then Thank because you. while we were discussing I like the episode, so. I'm like <laughs> <laughs> behind the eyes. Charles was probably like you know kind of steepling his fingers, going, ah, Excellent. he doesn't know. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. But, uh, but yeah, I was blown away. I was like, huh? What's he doing there? And then, like, two minutes later, they're having sex. I'm like, what is going on? So you, you know? so you did not see the two of them hooking up at all? No. I, I As Quicksilver would say, I did not see that coming. So. <laughs> yep, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Or you mean, as Quicksilver's future corpse said. <laughs> Very nice. I see what you did there. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. Um, 
But no, it was, I was blown away. And it seems like apparently they've been having a relationship for quite a while. Right. From what we gather. Granted, like, I guess it must be a pretty open relationship, seeing as it seems like uh, Chloe does tend to sleep around. So yeah. either she's uh, very libertine in, in her ways, of in her amorous ways, or they have an open relationship. I or don't know he, or it could have just been like an occasional booty call. I suppose, and I guess Hutch is cool with that, I suppose, since he always is ending up in stripper clubs for some reason because he's looking for his dad. So I don't know what's up with that. <laughs> right. but, um, but, uh, but So what are you – so um, – But I thought – but I, I was blown yeah. away, and it seems like there is quite the relationship going on. I mean I think they do in their own way, at least Chloe, I think, possibly loves him more than Hutch does because I don't – Hutch even actually addresses like, are we carrying on with this, whatever this is? Yeah. So I think Hutch maybe is not as invested in the relationship. I mean, I'm sure he he has a great time hanging out with Chloe and what have you. But it seems to me like Chloe is more invested in that relationship than Hutch is. Because Hutch is probably like, she'll probably get tired of me at some point. Or he maybe literally doesn't love her. But like Chloe really seems to to uh, to be, I guess we could say, in love. And they make for an interesting couple, I suppose. And I can see why. Right. Uh, why um, the Utopian does not know about this, because Lord knows what would happen if he found out. Well, that's one of the things that, that Chloe warns him about. It's like, hey, you know, my dad has never been too kind on my boyfriends. Not to mention if it's Hutch, too, since yeah. they've been having words. Yeah. And, uh, and as we find out, since you brought it up, Hutch and Sheldon actually do have a little bit of a chat in this episode. Exactly. So what did you make of that? Yeah, it's like, let's have a free exchange of ideas. <laughs> it's actually, yeah, because what happens is, is like, um, Sheldon pops in, um, tra- like, Hutch is making his back alley deal, and then Sheldon shows up. So Hutch is like, cheese at the cops, and teleports <laughs> himself to Iowa. But Sheldon finds him pretty soon. Yeah, and because first I think he does the typical superhero landing, and he's like, yeah. "We have to talk." And then um, Hutch disappears, and then apparently we find out that uh, that um, Sheldon has um, uh, heat vision because you see these kind of rays kind of yeah. following uh, Hutch, and he's like, "Okay, okay, I give," you know. And so they they start talking, and right. uh, but yeah, and obviously we find out the whole deal is Sheldon is looking for uh, Skyfox. Yes, Hutch's father. Yeah. So. Yeah, because remember, there's this one moment where Sheldon, I guess, or I'm sorry, Hutch tries to get his power rod to come back to him. Yes. But Sheldon has it in his hand. Mm -hmm. But because Sheldon is Sheldon, he's able to keep it from leaving. Yeah, that's right. Like we see a little bit of a struggle, but he holds on to it. Yeah, because Hutch is like, come home or something. We use some. Right. phrase and it doesn't work or you see that it's the, the rod's trying to get away yeah like it's trying to leave his hand yeah but but for whatever reason can't so sheldon actually says look you know like i'm not here to get you i'm here to, just to talk about your dad so he gives the rod back yeah to to hutch but i thought it was interesting that apparently sheldon can stop the power rod which I think tells you how powerful Sheldon must be. Right. And we've seen some hint of it, and there must be a reason why everybody lives in fear of the utopian. Right. So he must literally be, like you said, the analog Superman. Even he's, at this age, he's still yeah. like, insanely powerful. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like Superman, who is considered one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful superhero in the DC universe. Yeah. So it, it stands to reason. And obviously the whole thing is, and I'm sure we'll get to it, is because they're looking for um, Sky Fox because of what is found in the Black Star corpse. Yes. So, so yeah, and, uh, and it seem, seemingly Hutch doesn't even know where his father is. And apparently his, the Rod can't even take him to because. Apparently, whenever he says, take me to my dad, he says, I always end up in a strip club. So <laughs> you think to yourself, either his dad literally does manage multiple strip clubs around the country, or he's in the adult industry at this <laughs> point, or, or the Rod's trying to tell something. Well, I think what Go happens ahead. is that probably, I'm guessing, George probably put a, a fail safe in the Rod yeah. that if, uh, that if um, Hutch tried to use it, that 
you know, it would just constantly take him, you know, redirect him to to the nearest strip club. I guess it's kind of like maybe he's like, you know, I know he'll be frustrated because yeah. he can't reach me. At least he can vent his frustration with these lovely ladies. It's almost like kind of like being redirected to voicemail, you know, that <laughs> <laughs> it's like, look, I want to just talk to you. No. Oh, redirecting to voicemail. Oh, Ex- except with strippers, <laughs> except with strippers. So upgraded voicemail. All right. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> That's exactly it. <laughs> right. so, yeah, so I guess it's also George's wicked sense of humor as well. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Well, you know, we know that George could have been, it was quite the card, you know, as we, yes. as we know. So, um, yeah, he's, you know, he's, he thinks the power rod might be able to help them. Sheldon says this. But it turns out that, um, you know, that, like you said, he goes up to a strip club and then they have some choice words. Sheldon calls him son. Hutch doesn't take too kindly to that. And, you know, like he reminds Sheldon that, look, I'm not your son, nor is I'm not anything like my father. And Sheldon comes back with like, Look, I, I looked away from everything that you've done out of respect for George because he was my friend. Mm-hmm. And all I need to know is like, well, just let me know if George tries to reach you, reach out to you. OK. Yeah. And so after that, we go back to Hutch and Chloe having another intimate moment where Hutch tells uh, Chloe the news that, oh, by the way, your dad dropped by. <laughs> and I was like, way to kill the mood, dude. <laughs> yeah. And Chloe, this is where Chloe talks about, like, well, you know, he does have a thing about my boyfriends. They try to, he tries to intimidate my boyfriends. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he talk, Hutch says, no, that wasn't a case. He's just looking for my dad. And he doesn't think that Sheldon even knows that they have a relationship. And if he did, I'm not scared of your dad. Yeah, which which actually seems to be a turn on for her because she's getting yeah. dressed. Well, and think he, about she it. Says that... <laughs> well, think about it. Yeah. You know, remember we talked about how Chloe has all these daddy issues. Yeah. And so, if you're someone like Chloe, you want the exact guy who wants to be nothing like your father. Well, yeah, she. It, it's evident that she looks the opposite of her father. Yeah. We saw it with the, shall we say, the random encounter with the Nick, Nick of Time. Yeah. You know, who was like playing the guy who was like, screw the union, you know, I'm powered, but I don't believe in that stuff. What she do? She takes him to bed. Yeah. And same thing with Hutch. You know, I think that they had actually just finished having sex and they were getting all dressed. And he's like, oh, you know, I'm not scared of your father. So, okay, let's go at this <laughs> again. So. Right. And I do think it's kind of it's kind of makes me laugh that the character is called Hutch, yeah, like a rabbit, and they are literally at it like rabbits. Oh, I see what you did there. That's funny. <laughs> so I I just thought of that because apparently she also compliments him on his sexual prowess. See, well, so I, just, myself, see I just thought it was because his last name is Hutchins. Like his I dad. know, but it made me kind of think of the fact that they do tend to copulate like rabbits, and he she apparently compliments him on his sexual you know prowess. So I'm thinking, right. ah. <laughs> it works both ways. There you go. It's a win-win for everybody, right? Yes. Okay. Anything else about Chloe and Hutch you want to talk about? No, I, it, it, I do wonder where, where it will go. Is when, it seems like an, a curious relationship. I have a – I don't know why, but my thought is um, between the two, I think Hutch would be almost more prepared to drop her than she would him. But at the same time, he does care about her because, heck, he did take her to the hospital – when he, he found her, uh, that she'd overdosed, not to mention she had snorted product that he was supposed to give somebody else. Yeah. And he actually points that out to her. But then the subject is literally dropped because yeah. he's like, oh, you know, you finished something that wasn't yours. And that, that's pretty much the end of the discussion. Well, it's almost kind of like a Romeo and Juliet thing a little bit because yes. because she's from the hero side. He's from the villain side. Mm. And so, so you have like the son of a hero or the daughter of a hero and the son of a villain hooking up. Mm. Yeah, it is very much that kind of star-crossed lovers, I suppose. But, um, but I guess at the same time, 
I wonder how long Hutch would, would stick yeah. around. Well, you know, but, that's, that's a good question. I guess we'll find out. So Exactly. And, you know, it depends on how close. Again, the TV show stays to the comic. We'll see. Right. No, very true. Okay. But, yeah, sorry, I guess we'll see in the – I'm expecting the confrontation with uh, with Sheldon at some point because they're playing oh. it up. You know there's going to be a confrontation. You know it's going to come out. Like, hey, uh, hey, Dad, you know I'm banging the son of uh, Sky Fox. So. Yeah, exactly. Or the bathroom door opens and he comes out yeah. kind of wearing nothing. Yeah. He's like, <laughs> you. And then laser beams through the chest. Oh, suddenly maybe uh, Sheldon decides to break his code. <sighs> Shocker. <laughs> there you go. It's like, well, you yeah, wanted just... me to break the code, guys. Well, I just did. Get off my back. Because even Grace, I don't think even Grace knows who um, Chloe is dating. Uh, well, we'll see. That's Because that's a discussion, I think, that comes up in the next episode. Ah, okay. Yeah, because at that moment, Hutch is in the bathroom. Right. When Grace hovers by uh, Chloe's window you know, so I guess how convenient that he is not in the room at that moment. Right. I mean, unless Grace has X-ray vision. Just saying. Ah, okay. You know? Nice. Just saying. All right. Uh, topic number three. Let's move on. Let's talk about Barnabas, Barnabas Wolf and the Black Star clone. So we finally get back to the Black Star clone mystery after a couple episodes off. Yeah. And, uh, there, you know, like this is where Brandon is sent to the, check out the autopsy of the, of the black star clone, which is supposed to be his punishment. Mind it's, you. Right. Exactly. So they're at the union headquarters. Brandon's talking with his uncle, uncle Walter once again. So these two obviously have a pretty good relationship by now, once again. So while they're waiting for somebody else to arrive, so apparently Brandon doesn't like and as we'll find out, pr probably has good reason. Hmm. So Brain is trying to act like, well, I'm fine, I'm good. But Walter's suspicious of this. You know, we, Walter Walter says, you know, like I've been replaying the fight in my head. And every time it's like, you know, less clear. And Brandon asks Walter, well, what, what would you have done if you were in my shoes? And Walter's like, well, he kind of dodges the question. He's like, I don't have an answer for you at that right, point, I guess, right. at some point. But, that, but then he does say, well, you know, because of your decision, we're still here and nothing can change that. Yeah, I think he actually compliments him. You're actually braver than me. Yeah. So, so what did you make of of Walter with Brandon first? Okay. And, uh, and, I... and the way these two, the way Walter, you know, kind of, kind of, you know, trying to, again, try to mentor – you know, maybe just kind of persuade a little bit, Brandon. So he, here's the thing. I have a love-hate relationship with Walter mm. because okay. he's a really fantastic character in the sense he could be a superb mentor because he very much is the voice of reason yeah. in this mad world that is Sheldon's planet. He's the realist. <laughs> so, yeah. He's very much that voice of reason. And, I mean, he he's is the pragmatist. The, Maybe pragmatist, yes, but I think also to the point of cynicism, to where he seems very cynical. And I think he's gotten even more cynical in his older age. Right. He really got on my nerves in, in the 20s. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. in the, it's odd to say that. You know, it's like, oh, when he was back in the 40s, he was cool. But yeah. in the 20s, he was a, he was a tool. Yeah. But, um, but no. You're uh, cooler I, now I, than you were in the 20s, man. Exactly. The, when the, the, the 60s broke out, you know. Yeah. You, were, you No, 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 I, the, I, no, the previous 20s. That's right. I actually think there wasn't there a moment where they, there was that moment was like, what's wrong with you, man? I thought you were cool. I think that actually came out at one <laughs> point but, uh, between Sheldon and, and you Walter. You used to but... be cool, man. You used to be exactly. cool. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, he is the pragmatist. He is the realist. And I think he would be the ideal mentor for for Brandon. You do wonder, though, whether there is a, a hidden agenda. I guess maybe through comic book reading and superhero movie watching, superhero TV watching, you always wonder where these folks are like, come with me, you know, and this kind yes. of thing. It's almost like you wonder where there's a hidden agenda because you want to, you really want to hope, please don't be a bad guy or so don't do you, be a creepy so bad guy. Here's the question now. Do you think Walter has a hidden agenda? 
I don't know why, but so, I, look, I mean, this is a crazy theory. I yeah. wonder whether he actually knows where Sky Fox is and is actually working with Sky Fox. Ooh. I don't know. Is that one of your pet theories? It's one of my, it's right, it's exactly, it's my Kornacki board moment. There you go. He goes, <laughs> all right, so let's go back to, uh, to Nick Kornacki at the board. Yeah, yeah, his, because, with his murder board, you know, connecting the dots. And, I don't know why, because there seems something. There's, the, I don't know why. I kind of my my sense is tingling. There's more to this man than meets the eye. I could be completely wrong, but I don't know why. I have Spider Nick you know, sense tingling. <laughs> that's right. I'm. I don't know why. I'm, it might be the big reveal that he is actually in contact with Sky Fox. He actually knows what is happening. Yeah. It's odd. It's very strange. I mean, and, I, and as I said, and I'm praying literally that he is not a bad guy and he doesn't, his intentions are not, are not bad and that he doesn't want to kind of bring Brandon over to the dark side or do something terrible to him yeah. because he does constantly seem to, he wants to reassure him, but there's something, but almost bring him closer to him at the same time. It's a, it's an interesting dynamic. And once again, I really have to compliment the actors in this show. They are fabulous. It, they really, really, the, the writing's very good, and I think the actors are really, really selling it. Yeah, I think the casting was pretty solid in this one. When they Very much so. The first time it came out, you know, when they, when they first announced the cast, you know, a couple of years ago, I wasn't, you know, I, I wasn't sure if they could pull this off, having read the comics, but I'm pretty, I'm sold. You know, I think they, I think they can. They think they've done a great job with the characters and that's, you know, it's good writing, like you said, good acting and it's paying off. Yeah. And I, I hope they will continue to pursue this relationship between Brandon and his and Walter, because it seems like the only kind of stable thing in Brandon's life right now, outside of this girlfriend yeah. who Grace does not seem to be a particular fan of, he almost sees as like, who is this hussy with my son, you know, kind right. of thing. So it's, so it, she's like, "Oh, you're here." You know, kind of thing. It's like, it's like, what's this? You know, this, this, um, yeah, exactly. Doing in my, doing in my, talking to my son. Well, here's hoping Uncle Walt doesn't, uh, you know, betray everybody's trust. So we'll see. That's why the fingers crossed, so I, right? Yeah, right. I hope I'm wrong. Well, we'll see. Well, hopefully you're right. I mean, hopefully you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops! All right. So Barnabas Wolf shows up. Oh yes, and in a very flamboyant entrance, very eccentric. That, there's your narcissist. That's right. the narcissist, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Yes, exactly. So Barnabas Wolf um, is, alludes to the idea. Apparently, he's like an ally of the union. I don't think he's in the union, but he seems to be someone who they know. So they're bringing he's a him. Consultant he's a something. consultant. That's a great term for this. Yes, so they're bringing it. They bring him in to look at the corpse, and apparently, he alludes to the idea that he and Grace, um, you know, I, I guess you know what, no, I'm sorry that he they bring him to the autopsy room where Fitz and Petra are, and. Fitz explains that the clone has identical armor to Black Star, and that it's fused with the underlying tissue. Yeah, which is kind of interesting. It's like it's it's connected. And, so it's literally like attached to his skin. Yeah, exactly. Will. It's it's bonded. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So there's no way to get the armor off without peeling his skin off. Mm -hmm. And Barnabas is like, "Oh, is that only the problem?" So. Barnabas uses his power to slowly separate the armor. So it's it's like ripping the Band-Aid off slowly mm -hmm. instead of just ripping it off. And so it's it looks very painful, even though the guy is dead. There's no reason it yeah, should Yeah, I mean, be. notice how the camera lingers yes. on the, the, the armor the gruesome, and the little the pieces yes. of skin. Yeah, the gruesome elements, right? Really tries to make you feel that a little bit. Even though, like I said, the guy's dead, so it doesn't matter. Um, it's just a body. So this allows Fitz and Petra to continue with the autopsy. And while they're trying to remove the liver, Fitz realizes there's something else inside the body. Mm -hmm. A puzzle ball of sorts. So Barnabas examines it. And when he, you know, does his little, like, you know, 
Rubik's Cube like manipulation. Yeah, he, he's there doing his jiggery pokery. Jiggery word. pokery, great word. <laughs> and he unlocks the, the puzzle box, and out, out pops a a puzzle ball. Excuse me. Um, and he unlocks a he brings out a pocket watch. Mm-hmm. Now, where have we seen that pocket watch before? Mm. Oh, by oh, yeah, it's just the the one that's the one that belonged to Sheldon and Walter's father. That's right. So, obviously someone is sending a message. Exactly. And there you're like, the plot thickens because mm. evidently whoever this is knows these people very well and very intimately. Right. So, what did you make of that? Well, here's the curious thing because I believe, I'm not sure whether it's actually Walter who says... This could. This seems like the the doings of of Sky Fox or of George because yeah. he always loved a puzzle. Yeah. Not to mention that obviously at this point they are at odds and uh, he is literally a villain at this point and, yeah. and nobody knows where Sky Fox is, which of course then sends Sheldon off on the hunt for Sky Fox and yeah. uh, everything we mentioned earlier. So. I mean, I I was blown away. I was like, "Wow, I really like this. This is a nice reveal." You know, when you went after well, and, you know, has done his, and it makes yeah. sense because Sky Fox, we know, you know, George was really good at puzzles. He was the one that figured out um, what Sheldon was trying to do back in the 1929 mm-hmm. with you know scribbling all those circles around and all that. He will he pieced those together. So it, it confirms certain... what you were saying about him being the Batman analog. Right. Because like the world's greatest detective, just like Batman is. Yeah. Yeah. That's literally George's, George's thing. That's his superpower almost. Right. Yeah. His superpower is to be Batman <laughs> in that regard. <laughs> exactly. No, but I mean, I like the fact that, um, the, I said that uh, you immediately get, Oh, it could be Sky Fox. I mean, I, I'm trying to recall whether it's Walter who, who uh, makes, comes out with that theory. Because, as I said, it could play into the grander scheme of things of Walter's trying to throw people off the scent if he does if he does have more to do with it. Okay, so so if he does, so th- so th- that was my next question, but I think you kind of answered it already. That mm-hmm. you you kind of feel that if if Walter is up to no good, like you're being concerned about, do you think he was trying to put the blame on Sky Fox? That's why I think because you know if we want to feed that theory, yeah. it's maybe he's trying to throw them off the scent, saying obviously you know I can use yeah. Sky Fox as a scapegoat because he is a villain. So obviously they they you know why would they mistrust dear Uncle Walter? Of course yeah. they're going to go after somebody <laughs> who they know is a is a known felon and a known villain. Right. So it so on one hand it could be that because obviously um, Walter himself knows all about the pocket watch and was there on the voyage, which we will discuss and knows right. all the intricacies about the watch. Well, so, the, fact, I mean, the fact that they were on the union in the union together for all those years. And, you know, there's that big gap of 70 years or excuse me, 90 years between 1929 and the present day. Exactly. So that watch could have ended up any kind of way, you know, between, you know, from, from the 1929, to, to the present day, you know, anything could have happened between now and then. <laughs> it's like the watch in Pulp Fiction. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Butch's watch. Butch's, Butch's watch. Father's watch. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, we won't, we won't talk about where that watch might have been placed. Yes, exactly. That watch has seen some interesting places. Especially if Christopher Walken is involved. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just saying. Okay. Yes. But, uh, no, but that aside... It does. It does. It does pose quite the puzzler. And at this point, I am so hungering for Sky Fox to actually show up because yeah. one, I really enjoyed the actor in the twenties. Secondly, I really want to see what George is like these days. And I hope we. W- I am assuming we will eventually. Sheldon will eventually find him. Right. But, but um, and and of course, everybody's like, "What's uh, George trying? Well, yeah, George trying to say with this watch? What's the message he's trying to?" And everybody now is thinking, trying to see if there's a riddle, if you will, that that um, Sky Fox, in inverted commas, has sent them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But but I, I agree with you. I love the fact that they're building up. They're trying to make you anticipate and 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 want to see Sky Fox. They're they're building the building him up. 
Oh yes. For his return, because you know it's coming. The question is when. And uh, in the meantime, though, what did you? So you. So what was your reaction to Barnabas Wolf? This is a character I think we probably will see again at some point. So what did you make well, of his introduction? Uh, well, I am a magic geek, uh, yeah. big time. So I mean, obviously, big fan of the Harry Potter franchise. Big fan of any magical characters we have in comics. Big Constantine fan, like yourself. You know, so uh, <clears throat> he reminded me a little bit of the wizard from Star Girl. Okay, if you will, because he yep. without the southern accent, he's he's the British version of the wizard almost. All right, because uh, because he has that kind of flamboyancy. You can tell that there is maybe some animosity because he maybe was vying. The wizard or the great... gambler? The gambler, pardon me. The gambler. That's right. That's what I was trying to figure out who you think. You're yeah, no, about. exactly. I got my wires crossed there. That's okay. A little That's bit. all right. I just want to make clarify. Yeah. It's probably been way too long since I've seen Stargirl. Time to watch Stargirl again. New season coming up. Exactly. Exactly. Time so, to um, exactly. So, so yeah, I, uh, I, I wonder whether there was some animosity because he seems to be vying for Grace's affections as well as an ambulance passes by. Right. <laughs> oh, must be Sky uh, Fox. No. Exactly. <laughs> But uh, no, because because he he, he kind of does kind of flirt with her a little bit. He's like, oh, I don't like that color, and he puts her in red. And Grace is like, you know, yeah. you be thankful I like this color because apparently she she sees him. And he's a little bit slimy. He's a little bit oily. Well, he's a little, he, she... little touchy feely, and he's kind of hinting, you know, what? Hey, you know, we might have hooked up if Sheldon hadn't got to you first. Yeah, and you could have called me daddy. <laughs> yeah, but I, I would think that. If someone, like, changed my dress without my permission, you know, if I was Grace, right, that, you know, I'd be pretty perturbed by that. You know, like, just, like, look, so, you know, you're doing this against my will. You know, it's like, no. Yes. And, he, and he's kind of acting like, well, you know, if I could do whatever I want with you, like, almost like you're my toy. Yeah, I think that's which once again feeds, I think, into, into his narcissism about how, you know, he is his, his, his biggest fan. He's his, he's his own biggest fan. Right. And, and I think the idea is that, um, that uh, you know, as I said, that, yeah, Grace, but Grace keeps it together very much so. She doesn't seem to, uh, you know, to, to kind of yell at him. That's why she makes a comment of, I don't know what's going on today. I don't know. There's <laughs> uh -oh. another one. Maybe we should check the news, though. <laughs> No, hopefully everything's okay. Um, but no, I, but yeah, so I think that's the, that's the thing. Cause she, stay you know, safe, seems, Milan. Stay safe. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure everything's fine. But, uh, cause we'd seen Grace in the twenties and she was quite the, the, the potty mouth. Here she seems to that's keep it together. Personally. My kind of girl. That's why I love Deb and Dexter for that exact reason. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, and here she keeps it very much together. She's like, you're lucky I like red. So, uh, so yeah, he's, he is, as I said, very much the slime ball, the yeah. little bit of the oily guy, but he is so fun to watch. He really is. I mean, since you, you're disgusted by him, but you can't help watching him. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's he what obviously, I love. And he I, obviously knows how to make his presence known. And he's also very interesting to watch. I agree. Yeah. I, I kind of wanted more of him because I thought that the, the actor just did so well with the, with the parts yeah. and just, the different vibe he brought to the whole thing, because he, he is so dismissive of non-powered people. And we see this, obviously, with the medical staff, where he's happily doing all this stuff. And he's like, oh, you know, you poor little humans can't get it through your tiny little skulls of what I'm doing. Yeah. And so, and it's like, you were a human being once yourself, dude. It's like, you're not, you weren't born with these powers. I don't know, unless he was, but uh, I don't know. It could be wrong. Yeah, but, he's, um, the kind of vibe I get from him, he's almost like, I know you don't watch Star Trek, but uh, Q from Star Trek, the next generation in Deep Space mm. Nine. So this, you know, this very powerful being who sees himself as above mere humans, mm. very arrogant, very self-absorbed and... Unfortunately, like I said, very powerful. So, which is the worst combination? Oh, of course. Which, which, uh, and it seems like um, so Barnabas maybe... is is Go just ahead. as powerful. It seems like Barnabas is just as powerful because if he can like open up a wall the way he did when he came through and gave a hint of what he can do, the guy potentially could be quite the menace. Yeah, he could. He could. So, yeah, we'll see if that happens. But 
in the comics, Charles, does he get quite a bit to do, or by well, well, like a I said, you know, character? Uh, he does quite does mm. get quite a bit to do. So I get the feeling if we should see him again. Now, if we don't see him in the next couple of episodes, mm. we should see him in the season two if okay. the show gets renewed. So we'll see. Okay, I guess so we'll find he plays out. Quite right? the role, then. Okay, he should. We'll see. Okay. But but I get you know. I'm hoping that they just didn't introduce him to say, oh, hey, we got him in there. Yes, like our comic book fans, we did look what we did for you. Shiny new object there for you to look at. Yeah. So. I mean, were you reading the comics? Were you happy with this portrayal? Oh, yeah. I thought it was pretty dead on. Uh, I'm just curious to see where they're going to go with it because this introduction, like I I said in my trivia section, is very different from the comics. So. Right. Right. So we'll see. All right. Final topic, finally, for uh, this first episode. The Union Starts Uniting. Uh Aha. So we go back, way, way back to 1929, where the Union starts coming together a little bit as Mm -hmm. as we we finally get moving forward toward the island. You know, we start, um, you know, it's 1929, so um, Jane's trying to have a conversation with Sheldon about their upcoming wedding. But he's a little busy because he's still having visions, including the farmer reciting those coordinates. And Jane tries to talk him, you know, talk with him, but he keeps getting drawn in further and further. And ultimately, um, Sheldon goes out looking for George to tell him that, well, you were right all along about the farmhouse and the map. And they start sharing everything that they saw there. I think it was all part of a puzzle or a test. And Sheldon, you know, is convinced, like, this is going to lead to something that's going to change the world. Because, remember, he's a utopian idealist. So whatever we, you know, like, this is my vision. Whatever, you know, we got to do this because, you know, it's something that's going to revolutionize the world. I don't know what it is, but it's going to change. Yeah, exactly. Just trust me. It's going to be big. (laughs) You know, it's indoor plumbing. It's going to be big. Big. Yeah. So, um, so they start, uh, you know, with George, you know, they, they kind of, um, they arrive at the United Front newspaper which I thought was a very interesting name for this newspaper because it kind of sounds like the Union, right? Exactly. So I wonder if that's where they're going to go with. So they meet up with Grace. But Grace, as it turns out, is in the process of being fired. Yes. And, it, you know, she's like, well, it's because, you know, I'm a, I'm a woman. Mm-hmm. And she thinks Sheldon's there to sue her, but Sheldon pitches her this opportunity. So essentially we have George and Sheldon going around recruiting people, starting with Grace. Yeah. And it has to be specific people according to Sheldon's vision. And and George is key to this because Sheldon, let's say, is not exactly the PR guy or rather he doesn't make for a good salesman and it's it, it seems like George almost corrects his roots every time Sheldon opens his mouth right so so i think for the most part if we do assemble our our team for the most part i think George plays i'm not saying near 90% but 80% of the work is done by his excellent salesmanship and just the way he's able to talk to folks because Sheldon is very candid and very open about it all George kind of, you know, he's like, don't reveal too much, make it tasty, you know, but mm-hmm. don't give a, give away everything. So, I, and, I, and they work so well together. It was just such a fun, it was like the odd couple on, you know, going right. off to do stuff. Well, it, it, it seemed very odd, like you said, it's like an odd couple relationship where George is the calm, rational one who, like you said, knows how to sell this. Sheldon is this this crazed dreamer and who, you know, we're not entirely sure. Like, he knows what he's talking about, right? So, yeah. but it almost, fe- to me, it almost feels like if 
if Sheldon hadn't gone to George, this whole thing never would have happened. Oh no, he had to, what... he had to start with George first because we George should... helped convince the others to come on board. And not to mention, George was the only one who believed him, right. which really strengthens, I think, shows you how deep, as I mentioned earlier, their bond runs. Right. Because when everybody else was saying, you know, you're totally off your nuts, you're totally crazy, pay no heed to my mad brother, yeah. jo- George is the only one who will literally listen to, as we'd seen in the previous episodes as well, where he's literally... As Walt put it, literally feeding into his fantasies. Yeah. But it's because George believes, says there must be something to this. And and yeah, and uh, George is key to this. Like you said, it would have been a complete failure. Because how are you going to sell something going into a like, I had a vision. Want to come? <laughs> yeah. Well, you just made me think of something. Yeah. Do you think that George would have been a better brother to Sheldon than Walter. Ouch. That's a very good question, but I think uh, maybe, maybe because the, the he, I mean, uh, it seems like Sheldon is literally grown closer to George than he has his own brother. Yeah. They really seem to have drifted apart quite a bit. I mean, I'm sure there's still that brotherly love between the two of them, but I think maybe Sheldon tends to, yeah, he might have made for a better brother, I yeah. suppose, because we'd seen him as very foppish and kind of very sort of self-centered at first. Yeah. But he, he really knows how to read people, and he does care. It does show you that the man does have a heart. Yeah. Just the Under, Underneath goes, all that, that playboy facade. Yeah. That there is, actually there, is something under, there is something under there. So it's there very interesting that, that, that that guy became the villain. Very true, but isn't it always the isn't it many times the cases where you have like the best friends that grow up and then uh, right. they end up becoming villains? I mean, it has happened before, not so often, but it has happened before. Yeah, right. Uh, but uh, but it's uh, I, and I and I and that's what makes you even more curious is what caused this rift. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of folks are waiting for that to be revealed. Hopefully, it will get revealed in the show of where was that heel turn moment? Right. Where where he where Sky Fox you know, decided to go over to the other side. Going back to Grace, as I said, she's quite the, the potty mouth. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, that's why I like her. But so, so, um, you know, Grace is, uh, you know, f- recruited by Sheldon and, and George. Yep. Then they go looking for Fitz. Mm-hmm. So they go, you know, they meet up with Willie. And his son fits, you know, they return home after struggling to look for work. And obviously things were a little awkward after what happened with the mill. Yeah. So it's amazing that they, that they were even let inside their home to sit down to talk. Well, I mean, because I guess it was um, it was uh, his wife that let them in because she because they because the Fitz and his father they come home right. and they're sitting at the table having coffee and like what the hell are these people doing in our house? Yeah, because they kind of blame Sheldon by association for having kind of sent them home or fired them or had let them go. I guess we could say yeah, right. because the fact that the, the the mill was going under. And also the embezzlement, and they fee- and they. And that's why I think it's almost guilt by association because it was Sheldon's father, not Sheldon, who was doing the embezzlement. But right. they, they hold him accountable they, as well for that. Well, he's just a, re- a big reminder for one thing. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, look, sure. we still don't have the money that you pr- keep promising that we were going to get. Yes. So and you laid us off, and, and you laid out. us off, and so how can we trust you? So Sheldon has to try to convince um, Fitz. But Fitz isn't having it. Fitz has no desire. So they kind of send them packing. And it's only when Fitz's dad, Willie, gets a hold of him and says, look, you know, you've got an opportunity here. You know, you should go for it. How often do you get to go, you know, to the other side of the world? Yeah, not to mention he's like, oh, he's really a horrible man, isn't he? He's offering you a job. What yeah. a terrible person. <laughs> right. So, um, so, and it's interesting because, you know, Sheldon and, and um, George are sitting there in the car outside trying to figure out their next move. Like, well, we need fits. 
Yeah. And we have no idea how that's going to happen because as far as they're concerned, that's that's done. It's not happening. Yeah, they've, yeah. So they're trying to figure out what to do because they need everybody according to Sheldon's vision. So Fitz finally comes out and he like agree, tells them, okay, I'm in. You but know? I want to be paid up front. <laughs> yeah, it's, it kind of reminds me of a – I don't know if you ever saw that Rick and Morty episode. You mm. son of a bitch, I'm in. <laughs> Yes. You know where they do that, he, where they do the Ocean's Eleven parody? Yeah, when they're assembling the team, yeah, yeah. for the for the heist kind yeah. of thing, yeah. So that's yeah, what very it, much so. that's what it kind of reminded me of a little bit. Yeah, it, it, for sure. And also I have to say, yeah, Fitz is a very good negotiator cuz he's like, "Okay, I'm in, but I want to be paid up front." Right. And I I wonder which I'm assuming that it's probably George who's the guy who has the the money because I don't know how what oh, well, well, I remember, he doesn't well... have money at this point, right? He's broke. So I'm assuming that the whole thing is funded literally by Sheldon. It has to be. I assume. Or, or, or no, 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 I take that back. It's probably Walter. Walter's probably the one with money, right? He, so he's the, he's the most reluctant of them all. And Walter's he probably the finding... bank on this. Yeah, he, he's the most, almost the most reluctant of them all. Yeah. And he's financing the operation. Right. So, um, so they, so that's what's going on and, you know, they go back, um, Walter's there, they go back to Walter's house, try to talk to him for Sheldon, uh, you know, George does and Walter's still like, you know, Sheldon's sick and you're just feeding his delusions, yada, yada. We've heard this before, Mm -hmm. but George says, look, all Sheldon is trying to do is to get better and maybe playing along and getting on the ship will be the thing that Sheldon needs to do just that. And maybe you need it too. Yeah, exactly. So I thought that was a very good moment. And then this is where we go back to Jane's house and Sheldon's packing up their stuff, getting ready for this trip. He's like, yeah, you know, uh, George got Walter to get on the trip. So he, George is, or Walter's in. Mm-hmm. And Jane's worried that look, okay, I'm kind of having second thoughts about this. Um, you know, because she poses the question: was Was I in your vision? Right, and that was and he's like, like yeah. Uh, mm. yeah uh, look at the time, gotta go, honey. Bye. <laughs> so yeah, that's a great point. So it's at that point she realizes that she has no future with Sheldon. So she, so she leaves her engagement ring on the bed, tips out the door. See ya. That's, yeah, and that's and that's exactly and that's uh, that's her done, I guess, because yeah. Um, yeah. So but this it, is apparently the final sacrifice that Sheldon had to make before this voyage. Yeah, because I mean, eventually he does come out and tell her that she wasn't in the vision, but yeah. um, it's what I thought was uh, was curious is how invested everybody is in this vision, especially Jane, who. Thinks he's crazy, but the fact, or still mad, yet she she feels this vision holds so much weight to the point to where if I'm not in his vision, it means he doesn't love me anymore, and I've got to leave. Yeah. All right. I know there was a lot we unpacked there, so yes, a lot longer than I thought. I was, you know, I knew I was worried about this one, but there was, <laughs> but I knew there was a lot of things we had to cover. So uh, apologies. So what's your rating for this one? I'm going to give this uh, 8 out of 10 hidden watches. Okay, that's good. Well, then I'm going to give this one. I actually like this a little bit more. I like this 8.5. I'll go with fancy walking canes. Nice. All right. I was going to go with pocket watches pulled from a Black Star clone, <laughs> but I had a feeling you might Shame. go with pocket watches, so I just I had a backup. Yeah. All right. Let's move on. The next episode, Cover Her Face, the sixth episode of Jupiter's Legacy. Mm -hmm. This one only has three topics, so hopefully we'll get through this a little quicker. Um, Topic number one, let's talk about Grace, Chloe, and Hutch. Mm -hmm. So Grace, you know, we find out that um, she and Hutch are about to... I guess Chloe and Hutch are about to have their own intimate moment, but Hutch is like, I got to go to the bathroom. Yeah. So Chloe, you know, she's kind of like waiting for Hutch 
and realizes her mother's outside the window checking on her because she's not answering her phone. Yeah, and then she'd heard from Jana that she'd been in hospital. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you, you bring up a good point because, you know, remember, you know, nobody had called Grace or anybody in the family, Sheldon or anybody, to let them know that that um, Chloe was in the hospital. So, but because Jana told Grace, Grace decides, well, I need to check on my daughter, understandably, right? Yeah. Yeah, because Jana's like, you know, uh, is Chloe doing okay? Is she still yeah. in the hospital? And uh, Grace's like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. But uh, apparently finds out that, well, they're no longer in the hospital. So she swings by her place. And um, they have a little conversation. Yeah, Grace wants to know why Chloe didn't tell her she was in the hospital. And she asks if it had something to do with Hutch. So she does know. I think. Yes. That they're seeing each or other. Or at least she has an inkling that there's something going on, yeah. Because she reminds Chloe, well, you know who he is, who yeah. he's the son of, and Chloe shoots back, well, Hutch isn't like his father, just like I'm not my like my father. Yes, exactly. And Grace says, well, you know, you're an adult, you can make your own choices. Um, she tries to go farther, but Chloe's like, oh, I know you're going to just give me a lecture. Yeah. And the fact is oh, that this reflects on your, on the whole family and what you do reflects on the entire family. Yeah. Right. So, so essentially Chloe asked her mom, if you ever had any thoughts about, you know, your own, instead of just constantly siding with dad mm. and, uh, you know, which is exactly the same thing. Um, Sheldon said to Chloe, or you know, as Chloe said to Sheldon, excuse me, the last time they spoke. So she kind of poses that under her mom this time, and Grace doesn't have an exp- you know a comeback for that one. And it's just nope. at that point where Fist is about to come back into the room. So, so what did you make of that encounter? Well, it, it's. I think it's the prelude to the little journey that Grace goes on in this episode, where her faith in the code is shaken, to say the least. Yeah. And uh, and I think that it will probably also she will probably have to re-examine everything that she believes once you know this this episode comes to a close and what ha- and what ensues in that because I suppose it's it might be just a case of you know, kind of stand by your man, if you will, you yeah. know, to use a Tammy Wynette's reference. Right. That, uh, that that's, that's how it, that's or what Blues Grace Brothers was. reference. I'll just put that out there. Yeah, exactly. Dep- depending, I suppose. Stand which very... by your man. <laughs> that's right. Whether, whether you're a fan of the, uh, the Jake and Elwood version or the yeah. Tammy Wynette's version, you know, that's, uh, it's up to you folks. Yep. But, um, but, uh, but I think that's what, what she's doing. But unlike uh, Sheldon, she's very much, I think, a little bit more understanding, if you will, or rather is not a, a, as much of a ball buster as her, her husband is. Because you know that Sheldon would have come into the room, right? you know, literally given her hell for the rest of the episode and probably Hutch would have come out and yada, yada, yada. At some point, she's like, okay, I get it. I'm, I'm going to get out of your hair and just, you know, Remember that what you do reflects on the family, you know, see ya. And yeah. so off she goes. So I think Grace is a little bit more understanding of her kids. And she had made that point previously to Sheldon. So I think she's being more of a parent, of a decent parent, if you will, compared to Sheldon. But, uh, and as we see, as I said, uh, later on in the episode, her, her faith in everything that uh, she stood by makes her re-examine everything. So she might end up thinking maybe Chloe is not so wrong after all. Well, and I also think that you know, maybe Chloe, I kind of wonder about this. If maybe Chloe thinks her mom is too passive so that, mm. so that it, you know, she's not confrontational enough. Yeah. So if I just kind of let her go a bit and, you know, that's it, she'll back off. You know, I won't have to listen to it too long because not like, you know, dealing with her father that, you know, is, you know, she instantly, if she's confronted with her father, her walls go up. Right. So with, with her mother, I think it's more like, well, I'll just, 
let mom spew her BS a little bit, and then she'll be gone. And yeah, can, and, and she probably knows back to how Hutch. to play. She probably knows how to play her parents at this point, or how to you know kind of deal with them. That's the vibe I got anyway. With that. Mm-hmm. no, no, very well put. I yeah. agree. All right. Anything else about uh, these characters in the, that conversation? All right. No, I think we're good. Okay. So let's move on. Topic number two. I just wanted to talk about that a little bit. Mm-hmm. This is more ma- the main thing going on in 2021. So Grace Ghostbeam, a.k.a. Janna, yep. and Baryon, where, you know, for being such a passive character in the modern storyline, Grace makes a very interesting um, choices in this episode. You know, like her she actions. Does. You know, it's we get to see a very different side of Grace. Or maybe I should say that maybe what we've been seeing up till now is starting to crack. Mm-hmm. And you know, Grace is looking at things a little differently now. Especially yeah. after what happened with Brandon and the way Sheldon has reacted to him and a bunch of other factors that Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like with Chloe accusing her of siding with her father all the time and mm-hmm. just a lot of other things. So I want to get your thoughts on, on the, you know, what, what we find, what we see in this episode is that um, Ghost Beam, you know, Jana, the one that kind of wants to be, you know, join the union, pretty much a goody two shoes as far as Chloe's concerned, but someone who I think Grace likes because she's Ghost Beam is kind of like the daughter she didn't get, didn't have, right? Mm-hmm. Something horrible happens to Ghost Beam. Baryon kills her, and it triggers a whole new side of Grace that we haven't seen up till now. So, what did you make of that? Well, as I, as I had mentioned previously, uh, I think her faith is seriously shaken, especially when it comes to her belief in holding to the code and what have you. Because early in the episode, she had shown up breaking up a moment where one of the other heroes was going to kill one of the other villains. Yeah. And she's like, that is not how we do things. And she was literally, she kind of literally gave them the, 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 you know, the talk, if you will, saying you don't do that. That is not the way the union acts. And she flies off again. Later on, of course, we find out the Baryon, who I believe is a follower of Black Star, at least that is what the cops were telling okay. Grace, or that's where he's depicted. So one of his followers, you know, kind of escaped into this building, and uh, and uh, and goes. So there's a connection kind of fun- there. That, that's what Paris mentioned. I mean, I don't know how much the cops know, but they said apparently he was one of Black Star's mm-hmm. followers. But maybe that maybe I that's important to the overall mystery of Black Star. So I think that's why I, it made me think about this. The Black Star has followers. But um, that said, yeah, because she then arrives, of course, Ghost Beam is dying. And she, in, with her last breath, she literally tells Grace, I did not break the code. I didn't kill him. Yeah. And I think that's the moment where literally Grace loses it. Because, yeah. like, you know, if, if this is what the code is going to cost us to wear – you're in a life-threatening situation and you'll let yourself be killed because you refuse to kill. Yes. She's not having any more of that, especially after you're basically seeing this young girl die. So yes. obviously she's on the war path. Everything else. In, and I was actually trying to figure this out, Charles. Because, so it, it, it's almost like, you know, she lost her protege. That's right. But like I said, I think it's also because she lost a, for lack of a better word, daughter. I'm putting that in quotes. It's like a surrogate daughter. A surrogate yes. daughter, yeah, because the daughter I wanted but mm-hmm. didn't get. So so Grace is obviously taking Ghost Beam's death very personally right now. I actually was wondering this because after that, they have, we have the fight with, uh, with Barry on, but and basically we see her literally punch him to death. But here's the thing. She then walks out of the building and tells the cops that he's still alive. Yeah. So is he still alive, or did she actually kill him, and is she kind of sort of lying to the I cops? Think, I think, well, th- there's a body in there. If they have to claim the body, and he is dead, um, that's going to cost, you know, I don't think the cops are going to have a problem with it. Mm-hmm. But 
she, I think for her own self, she caught herself at the last moment. Because we saw that then, of course, her, her costume is stained with blood. Right. And, of course, the, the, the camera itself almost seems like it's, it's as if us watching and we get yeah. spurted with blood in the face. Yeah. yeah. You know, and you know, there's a, they make a big deal when she goes back to her home and tries to clean up and clean the blood off and whatnot, wiping her hands. So she's washing well, she her hands heads, of the blood. Yeah, she literally heads into the, the tub. Discards the the dirty the right. dirty blood stained costume. Yeah, d- jumps into the shower and it's literally a cleansing thing. She's yes. trying to clean herself of what she's done. Yeah, and uh, and then but, of course Sheldon arrives and she's like and she obviously does not tell him what happened. She only says that uh, Ghost Beam died, but she didn't. She doesn't go into any further detail. Yeah, but but I like, but I think you know. Maybe she caught herself at the last moment. Like she was about to kill him, but didn't. Mm. So she could have given him that, that killing blow, but she didn't. Because I think, I think the cops would have been okay with it if she had. Mm. So if he was dead, why didn't she say it? Why didn't she say it? That's why – that, that, that. That, that was why I say it would kind of uh, contrast with what she tells the cops before she leaves. Yeah. See, I, see, I don't think she was lying to the cops or, you know, that, you know, saying he's alive and then they go in there and they find a dead body. I think it, I, I think if he was dead, she would have said, yeah, he's dead. He's not a threat anymore. Yeah. Well, she yeah, she probably, you know, beat him half to death, but yeah. she left him. You know, she knew that <clears throat> he would probably recover or in yeah. the sense that he is. He needs the medical attention. If yes. not, he will die. Right. But, um, right. but she, she didn't literally kill him. Yeah. So, so yeah, she didn't take that, that final step yet. No, in fact, she, she didn't so, give him that finishing move, if yeah. you will, that finishing punch. Finish him. That's <laughs> right. Grace yeah. wins fatality. Grace wins. <laughs> nice. But, um, but, yeah, it was just such a – I mean, credit to Leslie Bibb, the actress – who plays Grace? Kudos Phenomenal job in this episode. I, you know, I just thought I was very blown away by her performance here, especially you know just when she unleashes after playing such a you know, you know we got to see her later in the 1929 setting, but where she's kind of almost playing a different version as well. That you know that kind of that that kind of um, cocky you know 1929 version of Lois Lane. And yes, but with a lot more profanity. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, it's you know, it's a it's Netflix. You get away with that. But she, um, but but you know, and then in the present, you know, she's very, like I said, very calm and demure, passive, um, very stoic. But here, she just unleashes, and it's it's just such a, a stark contrast. And I know I was very impressed by, by the range there. Oh, you, you and me both, I think it was almost like pent up anger and frustration. Cause yeah. maybe she's been confronted in other situations. She's been a superhero for a long, long time. Yeah. She so has. You think of how many times has she had that temptation in inverted commas of literally killing these horrible people, but it's always held back. And it's almost yeah. that, you continue to hold back, you continue to hold back, you get to the point where you literally, like a pressure cooker, you explode. Yeah, and that's probably what happened here is because, you know, she's tried to get Sheldon to listen to reason about Brandon. That's mm-hmm. not working. She's tried to connect with Chloe. That's not working either. And now her protege has died. So let's say it's not wasn't a good day at the beach for Grace. <laughs> no, no, not at all. So... It's just all these factors and everything building up, like you said, like a pressure cooker. And and now here we are. And it's going to be very interesting to see where Grace goes forward, I think. Very much so. And, and whether this will put a further strain on the relationship with, with Sheldon. Yeah, because, you know, she's trying to – now she has a secret. Like, she lost it with Baryon. Didn't kill him, as far as we know. But – Almost did. So one, what's going to happen if Sheldon finds out what Grace did? And two, what's going to happen when Sheldon finds out that Grace kept a secret? 
And also, I think the reputation that she has as like the matriarch yeah. of the superheroes, right? Where because it almost makes paints her as a little bit of a hypocrite at this point. Because the younger superhero is like, "Oh, you tell us not to kill and not to do the uber right. violent stuff, and what do you do?" So either will they either she either become a pariah because of that, yeah. or the younger superhero is like, "You go, girl. You yeah. know that's how you do it." Or or you're know, like, this could create a schism. Between mm-hmm. uh, Sheldon and, and Grace, that could divide them. You almost have like the, the two factions. That's yeah. Right. Well, it's you know, the, the, it is almost like a community. It, it's it's the you know Jibber's legacy civil war, <laughs> where yeah, you know Grace will be on one side and Sheldon will be on his side because and he'll be the only one on his side because everybody else is on Grace's side. <laughs> I can so imagine the right. team ups, and right. Sheldon looks to his right and his left, and you hear crickets. Yeah, he's like, "Who's with me?" Cree, 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 cree. Well, yeah, you know, like you, 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 like, okay, here's Grace's side, and you know, like lines of superheroes, lines of superheroes. Then you cut over to Sheldon's side, and it's just Sheldon right there. Yeah, and they said crickets. Like, in look, the around, look around, like, where's everybody at? And and the and the ball of hay uh, yeah. uh, moves by. We hear a wolf howling in the background. Right, right. So, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. All right, but uh, yeah, I can't wait to see where Grace goes with her. All right, third and final topic, mm-hmm. nineteen twenty nine. So, we had the union start uniting in the previous episode. Well, the union uh, finally unites. Union. Is united here in this final in this sixth episode, where at the very end of the episode, the last remaining person that Sheldon said had to be there before they reached the island arrives, and you know we 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 get taken all the way. You know we go through the whole journey, and like I said, it's almost like a a you know a, a, sea, a, a sea adventure movie. Right. Yeah, exactly. I was hoping they'd have the typical guy with the, like the Irish accent going, "Ah, there's the foul weather abroad." Yeah. <laughs> well, that's more of a pirate accent, but okay. Yeah, but it's, it's kind of Irish, if you will. Apparently, it was it was taken from the Irish. <laughs> oh, was it? Because uh, mm-hmm. all right, I'll take your as the Irishman, or at least in the, of Irish descent. Yeah. I, will... I was hoping they'd be him or a Scottish chap or something or somebody <laughs> British right. who's like. Right. Yeah, we're coming across the port of Morocco or something yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so in, in 1929, they, you know, Sheldon and his crew try to secure a ship the, to go to these coordinates. Okay. So they hook up with this guy, Captain Borges or Borges. And he initially refuses them because, like, boats in that area haven't found themselves or find themselves at the bottom of the Atlantic. So it's kind of like the Bermuda Triangle. Almost. Right, yeah. And it's like, okay, you know, you get they offer money. Oh, that's not enough. And George is like, okay, Sheldon, we're going to have to find another guy. But Sheldon says, of course, is insistent, it has to be him. Mm. If we're going to find the island, he was in the vision, got to be him. So Sheldon in his head has this imaginary set of this checklist and everything has to be checked for this to work. OCD much? A little bit. <laughs> so if like one component isn't in this vision or, you know, from the vision isn't, you know, checked, it's, you know, it's all for nothing. Yeah. But somehow, you know, this is through Sheldon's, you know, tenacity. He's hoping that this will happen. So, so they they figure out a way. Walter offers some money on top of that. Yeah. It's like more money. Okay, what what's going to make you do this? More money. Okay. So they get <laughs> he the just ship. plunks down these notes. Yeah, it's that's like it. yeah. yeah. So problem solved, and you know they they get on the boat. Sheldon, you know, Grace is suspicious of Sheldon because he keeps arguing with himself. And every time she tries to learn more, George pops up out of nowhere, says, well, you know, no, it's no big deal. You know, he's just working things out. You know, just let him go. Trust me. It'll, it's fine. We're all fine here now. Thank you. How are you? <laughs> as as the show is kind of yelling at himself in his right. cabin. Right. Right. So 
this keeps going on. Um, there's a little like that we see the growing frustration with everything, where, yep. um, you know, Grace, Grace is concerned about Sheldon. She goes to Walter. Walter's trying. You know, like they try to figure out what's going on. Walter's you know like, look, Sheldon's okay, but Grace isn't convinced. Okay, she's not letting this go. And Sheldon and his crew are arguing because with the captain later on, the the, the pump stops working. Mm-hmm. And the ship starts taking on water. And the engineer, turns out, stayed back on land because the engineer didn't want to die. Yeah, apparently half the crew didn't come. Yeah. Yeah, so, so thanks for that, right? <laughs> so Fitz, thankfully, pitches in, tries to help out. And if we find out that apparently Fitz has some uh, engineering skills. And, of course, he is initially confronted with, with racism. Yeah, of course, because, remember, it's 1929, okay? Yeah. Uh, but he does stand up for himself. And, and in the process, kind of gets the respect of a couple of other guys. Yes. And, in fact, one of the other ship hands actually says to him, you should work with us. You know, you're good. You know? Yeah, we like you. And you stood up to this asshole. We do get that kind of. He was in charge. Yeah, exactly. This racist, bigoted guy. Yeah. yeah. And um, and yeah, it's because uh, because I think we do always get that moment of social commentary. We had it with Grace on how women are perceived, and sadly to this day, it still happens, folks. Just like unfortunately with Fitz's case, this stuff still does happen, mm-hmm. where people are just as racist and awful and bigoted. And uh, yeah, but he's offered a job, which I think was kind of nice. Like you should, you don't look for a yeah. job in America. You should work with, on the ship with us. Yeah, well, it was nice. You know, these guys reached out, so Fitz kind of felt, you know, accepted, which was great. Exactly. It's definitely a validating moment for him. Yeah, it, it was. And um, so they get the pump running, you know, yeah. so everything's back on track. Okay, so we, that problem was solved. And Fitz talks a little bit with Grace, kind of finds a little bit of a friendship there. Grace seems yeah. pretty, you know, you know, given, especially given it's 1929, seems comfortable at least talking with Fitz. Is it, you know, it doesn't have a problem with it. Um, he, uh, the, Grace ends up sneaking into Sheldon's room, finding his scribbles and a drawing of his father. And whoever drew drew that, I'm assuming it's probably one of the comic book writer, uh, the, the, the artists who actually worked on the show. I didn't recognize. I didn't recognize the artwork, but but it's really. I mean, the the uh, the portrait of his father is really really good. I actually really liked it. I have to study that closely, but I don't think it was anybody associated with the comics, unless uh, you know, maybe it was one of the the art directors or something on the show. But I don't know. It's a good question. So Sheldon and Walter show up, of course, at that awkward moment, accuse her of snooping. Walter sees the images, though, that he hasn't seen before, and their father's pocket watch, the watch again. Oh, yes, because that, we should also uh, remind folks that um, Sheldon did do a little bit of grave robbing earlier with the pocket watch. Yes. Yeah, we kind of forgot about that, didn't we? Yeah. So he's, like, so he's like, father's so he's like, wait, we buried that with dad. How do you have it? And Sheldon's like, eh, you know, things happen. <laughs> but yeah, I just so they, so they get into a world. fight, and that gets broken up by crew members and rushing back because George tells him something's going on on deck. Yep. So they all rush up. And they find the crew pulling somebody out of the water. Sheldon realizes this is the final person they've been waiting for. Yeah, because in his vision, he said there was a complete stranger who he'd never, ever seen in his life. And he's like, that's the guy. Yeah, he's like, this is the guy. Everyone is finally here. So so as far as um, Sheldon is concerned, all systems go. All the boxes are checked. We're good, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, the crews, of course, have, like, okay, so how did you end up in the water? And this guy introduces himself as Dr. Richard Conrad, mm-hmm. who is something, someone we will find out more later. 
of obviously because he's with you know everybody else right and he says he was a volunteer on the mission for the Red Cross it says that the ship was hit by a storm and as he shares the story Sheldon realizes hey that story is similar to the one the farmer told me yeah, because we then get that back and forth of the conversation he had had with uh, Old Man Miller. Right. And um, and I, you know that whenever I think of Old Man Miller, I keep thinking of Old Man Miller. That yeah. old. <laughs> yeah, let's, 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 that's a little uh, uncomfortable, but yeah. I, I know, but I, what can I do? <laughs> I, it, I, I can't help I it. <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, but uh, so the the ship... Enters the worst of the storm. They they get they get through the worst of it. Okay. Mm-hmm. They you know like a, there's all this you know tension and everything to build up through this entire episode at this point. Mm-hmm. And Sheldon, you know, with all this, um, starts to unravel more and more as they get closer to whatever. Yeah. He gets on the top deck and he threatens like, look. Because um, they're threatening to to turn the ship around because the storm is so bad, mm-hmm. yeah. and he's like, "Look, I'm going to shoot this guy, this helmsman, if you try to sh- turn the ship around." Yeah, and he's like, "We're all going to die if we turn back." Right, exactly. So it's a, it's this big standoff, right? He's like, "You know, we must turn back. The storm is too bad. You know, we're all going to die." And Sheldon's like, "But my vision." <laughs> I love the way he does it. Right. My vision, but candy. But but is that essentially it, though? Yes. It is. So well put, Charles. So well put. That's that's basically what it boils down to. I think that he's asking everybody, like, look, okay, certain death, okay, fine, but the vision, <laughs> guys, stay on focus, stay on, you know, keep your eye on the ball, okay? It's great for sure. Yeah. So. And then, yeah, we have these people yelling and screaming at each yes. other through this storm almost inaudibly because it's like right. the storm is raging. And, yeah. It was, it's almost like you know, a very old movie, which makes sense because it's set in 1929, right? You could, like, you could, you could kind of see this. It's almost like it's, it's like 12 angry men on a boat. I don't know. but Yeah, exactly. That, I, that's why I kind of add hints to Gold Standard at that moment because I'm like, have I seen this movie before? Yes. Make it in black and white, and it's it's a it's a typical nautical disaster. Turn the color off, you know. You, you, you it's right there on Turner Classic Movies here in the states. <laughs> so everybody else is trying to get Sheldon to drop the gun by this point, right? While this is happening, Sheldon sees his father again, who's taunting him, telling him, "All these people just want to see you fail," you know, trying to play on his own insecurities, right? Yeah. Grace finally steps forward between Sheldon and the captain. Right. She's like, it doesn't matter what you see or hear here is real or fake because it's real to him. Yeah, that's right. So she, that, you know, he, know, like Sheldon knows the way they, they're heading is the only way down. Right. So, mm-hmm. you know, but she tells him like taking a life is never the answer. And she eventually gets Sheldon to drop the gun. Yeah. And just as he does this, suddenly the clouds part. The ship exits the storm, and there's a ringing that starts getting louder and louder. Um, you know, because Sheldon is hearing all this ticking going on in his head from the pocket watch. It's very stressful. And then all of a sudden, the pocket watch breaks. Yeah, and then everybody can hear that ringing, and then as soon as the pocket watch breaks at 2.18 precisely. Yeah, yeah. well, it, 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 it's almost like a fever breaks. And I say yeah. this because I just had a fever, uh, mm-hmm. you know, a couple nights ago. So that's what it kind of, of reminds course. me of is this manic fever in Sheldon's head finally breaks. And at this key moment, all of a sudden we see Sheldon's amazed eyes as – um, Grace tells him there's something at the bow of the ship ahead. That's right. So they all rush to the bow and they look out. There's the island at Loved long it. last. And there's our cliffhanger. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of, 
Well, I mean, is this terrible of me? But I was kind of imagining the music from Jurassic Park to start yeah. playing. Yeah. I don't know why, but I guess that's because I guess obviously it's usually whenever people approach the island, that's what starts playing. But it was great. Welcome and it was to so... Jupiter's Park. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we spare no expense. But, <laughs> yes. But uh, but no, I, and, he, and I'm, this may be nitpicking a little bit, but what happened if they had they arrived there after 2.18? I mean, right. if it had been like nine in the evening, would the whole thing have been totally messed up? And like, oh, no, we've got to do this again. Yeah, like we got to start all over now. So. It's, it's a good question, but I think it's more like it was predestined, perhaps. Yeah, I suppose it is that uh, force majeure that kind of played into everything. Right, so. right. Like, a, like the universe was, you know, steering this all at this key moment. Yeah, of course. Yeah, the the planets were aligned and all that yes. good stuff. Right. Definitely. Right. So, but uh, but no, it's a, it's a beautiful moment and so well once again so well played by everybody and just yeah that moment of clarity yeah. and you do think to yourself if what I thought to myself is will at this point Sheldon stop having visions? That's is this good. like now the end of it all where he'll stop seeing his father and everything else and uh, where it was almost like a temptation of let's see if you're strong enough to do this and you're worthy enough. Well, I guess we'll guess find what's it, on the island. I guess we'll find out in the next episode. But, mm-hmm. but you know, at the, at the very least, it's now validation for Sheldon, right? Here it is. Yeah, he's he, finally convinced everybody. Like, everybody thinks he's crazy, and he almost proves it by trying to, like, threaten to kill, you know, people with a gun if they don't turn back or if they try to turn back. Exactly. And, and, like, and now here it is. He's proven right. You know, mm-hmm. so everybody else is kind of to ha- have to eat some serious crow, right? Like we all thought he was crazy and we're just indulging him. But here's this island where supposedly there was no island. He was right. right. Yeah. Yeah, because now he's like kind of pointing out and going, see, see, yeah. I was <laughs> right. I told you so. That's his I told you so moment. Yeah, it's like, you're like, I told you, 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 and you all didn't believe me, but there it is. Okay? Right. So you can suck it, you can suck it, you can suck it, you can suck it. <laughs> yes, it is that moment. I'm definitely looking forward to the next episode. And, right. and, and uh, yeah, my so, so yeah, it was great. It was another, another fabulous, fabulous episode. And great. yeah, as you said, Sirius Crow will be consumed by all present. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. All right. Um, what's your rating for this one? I'm going to actually give this 9 out of 10. Ooh. Um, storm. Yeah, Storm Clouds, I think it's going to okay. be. Okay. All right. I'm going to give this one 9 out of 10. HP Lovecraft novels. Yeah, I because was Fitz, well said. Because Fitz, Fitz made a comment earlier in the episode that, you know, that, you know, but talking about the reason that maybe the ships went down was maybe because of tentacle monsters that came out or something. And he's referencing HP Lovecraft novels. Yeah, and apparently, and the, he was. I think I think this was the period in which he was actually st- alive and writing these books. Yeah, because. Uh, Grace, like, but oh, he references crazy he, guy from Providence. Yeah, he references the great old ones, and so yes. yeah, so that's what I was thinking of. No, yeah. I thought it was a nice callback to we uh, us talking about the almost homage to Lovecraft Country. Yeah, so I kind of felt validated by that when when Lovecraft was actually brought up when they're like, oh, that crazy guy from Providence. Yep, that's yeah. the very same. Yeah, so I think this is the best episode yet. I mean, we're both give it solid nines. Amen. Yes, it is the best episode so far. So uh, that's the highlight as far as I'm concerned so far. Mm-hmm. We'll see if the yep. finale pays off and uh, we we continue that. But very strong episode. I just really love the direction and, uh, you know, the, the the sea adventure. Things are very tense. And I just thought it was very well acted and, and executed. Oh, I, I'm right there with you. And I'm a kind of a sucker like our... Yeah. Mutual friends and Sprouse of nautical adventures where things go awry. Right. So. Yep. Uh, Phantom Zone news. Well, the only I have something really quickly because I know we're running sure. way long, but I did <laughs> want to mention that Titans 
is returning for season three in August. Yay. So here's my next question to Nick. Yes. Does that mean Titan Talk, the Titans podcast, is returning in August? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> All right. You heard it here. That's right. So at long last, maybe Titan Talk returns. Well, um, and also, I mean, you know, all those wonderful folks who have liked the page on Facebook, I think it's about time we give them some new episodes, don't you, Charles? Well, now that we have almost 1,100 likes on Facebook, which is insane. Yes, and we can't thank you again enough, folks. Seriously, right? You know, I hope you're listening. I wish you would, I wish we get 1,100 likes on Facebook or, you know, for the Phantom Zone podcast. But, you know, we take what we get. But it's great that everybody is so supportive of Titan Talk. So, obviously, we're going to have a huge fan base to come back to, I think, mm -hmm. when we finally do some new episodes. So, just have to wait through the end of the summer. Only a few more months, and we get Titan Season 3. Excellent. All right. Now, we get to get some feedback from two people, Holly Mack and Dave Proctor. But I know we're Ooh, running way that? long. So do we want to hold that off or do we want to read those? Charles, I mean, I think we can read them off. I mean, okay. you know, it, it, they, they, these fine folks deserve their due, I they think. They do. I agree. But I just, I just wanted to run it past you because I didn't know how much of a hurry you were in. No, no hurry at all. Okay, because I know we're really screwing with the schedule because this oh. one's running way longer, way longer than I thought. All right. Holly Mack writes in. And thank you, Holly, for writing in always. Thank you so much. Hey, Charles and Nick. Hey, Holly. Hey, Before I started with a review, all this talk about the faraway island makes me wonder if we don't get a lost joke tossed in somewhere <laughs> let, later on down the line. Well, maybe. I kind of doubt it, but maybe. Just smells like something Dharma or heck even Hydra would do. <laughs> Nick, you were right. Chloe took something that didn't belong to her, and now she's going to have to pay for it. <laughs> I so agree with Grace that what Sheldon is doing to their son is a punishment. Sheldon, you're repeating in a way what your father did to you, and you're really not seeing it. That's a good connection. Well said, yeah. Lovely, Blackstar had a pocket watch inside him, wondering what that can mean. Mm -hmm. Love the flashback with Hutch and Sheldon convincing Grace to come with them and let her report on what they find out during their expedition. I wonder if Grace and Barnabas had kind of a past together. Just from the way she reacted to him, there's something in their past meeting that makes her not care for him all that much. It's a good question. Indeedy. Sheldon's psychiatrist really hit the nail on the head that Sheldon really doesn't want to see the world in shades of gray, just only black and white, that's causing most of his problems. Mm -hmm. The ships that disappeared sound like it could have been the Bermuda Triangle. That's what I yeah. hinted at. Of course, Chloe wouldn't tell her family that she's in the hospital. Some very tense moments when every, pretty much everyone in the ship finds out Sheldon has been seeing things. Man, the scene with Grace taking care of the guy who took down Ghost Beam. She really knows the rock and the hard place the younger ones are at because of the code. The scene on the boat at the end with, of the ghost of Sheldon's dad trying to get him to shoot everyone and old man Miller's warnings about it. Talk about another intense scene. Yeah, it was very intense. Mm -hmm. Really can't wait to see how the rest of this plays out. I'll wrap it up here. Holly from Wisconsin. Thank you so much, Holly. Thank you, Holly. Great that you write in, and thank you so much for writing in so far all season. Yes, exactly. Well, we got two more, so write in. <laughs> you know, don't get it. you got to keep your – you know, be like Sheldon. you got to check all those boxes, right? <laughs> Perfect attendance. Perfect exactly. attendance, right? David K. Proctor writes in. As well. Ooh, so, hi, Dave. Very short hey. one, though, from Dave, thankfully. So, he writes in, hey, fellas. Hey, Dave. Hey, Dave. I hope this email finds you both well. I'm a little behind on the show, but I'm really enjoying your analyses. You fellas are doing a good job of pulling out the tidbits of goodness. Well, thank, thank you, you, Dave. Keep up the good work as the countdown to Loki continues. <laughs> the show with your reviews... Is keeping us well entertained. Health and prosperity to all. Thanks, David K. Proctor. Thank you so much, Dave. That means a lot, as always. Yeah, it does. And you know what? Even if you're like, you know, Dave says he's behind on episodes, at least he's still listening. 
and appreciate what we're doing. I, and that means the world. I mean, as I said, it's yeah. a, I, I always love hearing from our from our wonderful listeners, Charles. They're always, they're always so, so, so gracious and so kind. So, And I guess, yes, the countdown to Loki continues. It does. It does. We'd love to. Go ahead. It seems like a, just a few folks are just really waiting for us to talk about that show. Right? It's, well, it's a Marvel Cinematic Universe show. Everybody's anticipating it. So. Of course. You know, it's going to be very pretty popular, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. All right. So we want to hear more from all of you out there. So please be like Holly and Dave. Write to us, phantomzonecast at gmail.com. That's phantomzonecast at gmail.com. Or you can find us on Twitter, at phantomzonecast on Twitter. Facebook, of course, the Phantom Zone Podcast, or Instagram, at Phantom Zone Podcast. And Nick, where can they find you out there in the wilds of the interwebs? <laughs> well, if you are, decide to traverse the wilds of the interwebs, folks, you can find me spinning the very best and nothing but the best of country music on the Whiskey and Cigarettes Show. And uh, to, for more information about that, you can visit our website, whiskeyandcigarettesshow.com. Podcast-wise, if superhero movies are your speed, I do host Happiness and Darkness, superhero movie podcast. We discuss all superhero movies under the sun. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And last but certainly not least, Gold Standard, the Oscars podcast, where myself and those fine, fine ladies, Rachel Friends and Sprouse, discuss discuss all the best picture films in chronological order from 1927's Wings to Present Day. We are right now smack in the 50s. Next week, we will be taking on the greatest show on earth with a certain Charlton Heston. So uh, if you are fans of the circus, you might want to check that out. That is uh, and, uh, that is a uh, gold standard. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter. And what about you, Charles? What, no love for Jimmy Stewart? Come on. <laughs> oh, no, of course. We all – much respect to Buttons the Clown. There much you respect. go. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> Over Charlton Heston any day of the week. <laughs> right, right. Exactly. Less Charlton Heston, you know, more more Jimmy Stewart, I think. All right. So as for me, of course, at Charles Skeggs on Twitter, at Charles Skeggs on Facebook, Instagram, at Charles Skeggs, or, you know, my blog at Geeky Things. Damn good coffee and hot Damn Good Coffee and Hot, where I talk about all the stuff we talk about here on the Phantom Zone podcast. So comic book news, comic book TV news, all kinds of sci-fi stuff, or just whatever I'm interested in. News of my other podcasts for the Southgate Media Group, including Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast, where certain DJ Nick joined me earlier this week to discuss the vampires of Venice, because who better, right? (laughs) Who better to talk about a story set in Italy than... Someone from Italy, right? <laughs> so uh, yeah. I really appreciate you taking the time for us. You know, you kind of pinch hit it on that one. You 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 helped us out and filled the, filled the gap in the schedule. So I really appreciate you doing that, and can't wait to talk some classic Who with you. Mm-hmm. Whenever and we actually you're ready, might ready. have to, we actually might have to discuss that when we uh, when we close the the curtain when the curtain comes down on this episode for sure, Charles. All right, all right. And then next week we're going to be discussing. Well, hey, the, Holly Mack. Whom you've heard here uh, responding to our discussions of Jupiter's legacy will be joining me next week or this coming week, I should say, to discuss mm-hmm. Closing Time, which features the return of James Corden as Craig Owens yep. and Stormageddon, Dark Lord of All. <laughs> and like you said, maybe some Cybermen. Oh, the and, and the Cybermen. Yeah. OK, maybe. So I hope everybody checks that out. If you've enjoyed Holly's emails, please check her out on Next Up Everywhere. She's fabulous. And may I also give a free plug also to the Five-ish Fangirls, of which Holly is a of part course, of? Of course, yeah. We, we love the Five-ish Fangirls podcast. You know, they've, they've been very good to both of us. You know, mm-hmm. we, we definitely appreciate everything they do and which Holly belongs to. And I definitely recommend checking them out as well because they're, they're just fabulous, fabulous people. They need mm-hmm. all the love from you out there in podcast land. Amen. All right. And then my other podcast, Ghost with the Twin Peaks podcast, they do with Zan Sprouse. We talk all things Twin Peaks, David Lynch, and Drunk Cinema that I also do with Zan Sprouse, a.k.a. the Gold Standard After Party, (laughs) where we talk about, you know, we have drinks, we enjoy our favorite movies, and coming up, well, we just talked Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yep. Which was a lot of fun. (laughs) And it's proving to be one of our more popular downloads, I might add. And then coming up next, yeah. though, we're going to be discussing Clue, the 1985 murder mystery movie with Christine Peruski, who's nice. a close friend of ours, you know, both of ours. 
and yes. has appeared on Next Stop Everywhere and is now going to be appearing for the very first time as our very first special guest host on Drunk Cinema. And I hope everybody checks that out. Sure, it's going to make for a very fun discussion. All right. So, everybody, thanks for listening. Next time on The Phantom Zone, episode 219, Omne Pro Uno, and mm-hmm. How It All Ends, the final two episodes of Jupiter's Legacy, hopefully season one. We'll see how this all wraps up, how it all ends. Are you looking forward to this? I know I'm looking forward to this. I certainly am, Joe. I certainly am, Joe. You know, uh, I think it's going to be very interesting. We said, we've talked about a lot of stuff here. We'll see how it plays out. And we'll see you next time right here on the Phantom Zone podcast. Bye, everybody. Joe.